Good morning. All right. Well, this morning I was, well, even last night I was struggling over what I was going to talk about. There was just too much stuff and just flying everywhere. And, and uh, so this morning I was getting up to, go, to do it early and I get a phone call. And it was just a little bit before six, so it was just as I was getting up. And uh, it, was, it was Miriam and Alan. And uh, so they, they called and, and uh, what happened was that on Facebook, um, I put up something that actually reveals my age a little bit. And so some of you might, as you actually recognize what I'm saying, might be pulling back the revelation of how old you are. But as, <laughs> God forbid that that would happen. But the idea was is that when I was a little boy, they, that one of the big things in my, that made me so excited was that an Oscar Mayer wiener truck came by our neighborhood <laughs> and I got to see one. So with that, I was saying, I put the picture up in Facebook and I said, for all of those who you know who this, what this is and can you actually sing the song, right? Yeah. And uh, so with that in mind, I get a phone call this morning. Miriam calls me. And she sings the song to me. <laughs> not happy birthday, not happy anniversary, not ha good to see you, but I wish I was an Oscar Mayer wiener. <laughs> yeah, what a way to wake up. Yeah. And if you could have sung that song with me, you know that you're, you're the age that I'm talking about, <clears throat> which is back in the wagon days. <laughs> No, it was really pleasant to hear them and to hear how excited they are about their getting rest and being with family. And uh, so this is a pleasure to actually be here. This wasn't planned. Actually, we found out that they needed to, to spend more time with their family. And I just said yes to this and not realizing when I said yes to this, my crazy schedule and all that's going on. And I'm going, oh, what am I going to talk about? So anyhow, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, here, the, the thing that's in front of us is the whole idea uh, that we've put together as a culture, and that is what, it's a Valentine's Day. And typically with Valentine's Day, we do a whole thing on romantic love and what love is and all that. We're not doing that. <laughs> if, but we are going to talk about love. We're going to actually discuss what love is and what, actually how to walk it out. Because a lot of times what we hear is that, you know, especially in terms of Valentine's Day, there are people who are doing extremely well in their relationship or they're just beginning a relationship and they're just excited as all get out that we are doing Valentine's Day celebration. Then there are those whose relationship is not doing so well, that it's, they're struggling and they don't know what's going to happen with it. Valentine's Day don't feel so good in those moments. And then there are those who have lost relationship, who have lost love. And certainly Valentine's Day don't feel so good there either. So there, when we say Valentine's Day, there are going to be those that are all over the charts, whether it be happy or sad or in pain. So forget I even said Valentine's Day. No. <laughs> but the idea is that what we want to do is we actually want to talk about love. And what usually happens when we talk about love is that when we talk about love, usually we know that we're supposed to love one another, that we're supposed to, to love our wives, love our husbands, love our kids, love our neighbors, love our enemies, and we hear all that about love, but really very few things ever come to us about how to love. How do we actually do that? I know I'm supposed to love. And I know I'm supposed to do that unconditionally. I know that I'm supposed to do that sacrificially. How do I actually do that? How do I apply it? So we'll start with just kind of with the scripture that kind of just starts the, well, as soon as, there we go. And it's out of Matthew 20, 22, 37 through 40. And it basically says that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. With what? All. all. So there is no reservation in love. One of the greatest sabotagers of love is when we reserve our love, only portioning in it. That love that works in what God intended love to be and how he intended it to, lo to work is his all in. No reservation. So what that looks like 
is that if I have reservation, let's take that to God and let's see, see how that works. So I go to God and I bring him my broken marriage. And God goes, no, nah, I don't think so. Why? He's reserving some of himself. He's deciding which one he's going to love and which one he's not. Which one he's going to handle and which one he's not. No, God is all in. And if we're going to love God, we're going to be all in. It's that love means full commitment. Now, it doesn't have, commitment has nothing to do with feelings. Feelings are totally different than commitment. How many of you have been married over 30 years? Anybody? So, has it always been fuzzy and wonderful? And <laughs> no. And you be careful what you say, Lee, because it could cause a little bit of trouble. Yeah, exactly. You should be a happy man for the, the entire time you've been married. There's been no bad feelings, right? But she, on the other hand, no. The, the idea then is, is that love has nothing to do with feelings. Yes, we can have them. And yes, they can be good. But just as good as they can be, they can also be negative. And if I'm basing my relationship or my love on how I feel, we're in trouble. There has to be a commitment that says, I'm in. Whether I feel good and excited, or whether I feel low and depressed and upside down. If I feel unloved, or if I feel fully loved. Whatever range of emotions that you're in, you've got to know that you've got to move past the feelings. Now, are feelings important? Absolutely. You don't blow away your feelings. They're meant to tell you what's going on on the inside. But they don't make your decisions. So when it says, love God with all of your heart, it means all of my heart. And then what it says, this is the first and foremost commandment. That means it matters more than anything else. Secondly, is to do like you did the first one. It means that in relationship with each other, we're all in. Not part, not some, not half, we're all in. And it's not based on emotions. Because when you first get married, man, the whole world is around that. Like, man, she's the most amazing person, he's the most amazing person, and you can, they can do no wrong, he's the perfect guy, she's the perfect woman, and then you get in the same building with each other for a while. <clears throat> and all of a sudden the flaws start coming and start showing up. And what happens is the emotions now change. And if you're walking your relationship with your emotions, you are in trouble. So the first thing we want to say is commitment. Commitment, making a choice to do, to walk with all of your heart. But not only that, but God, Jesus is the perfect example of what it means to commit. And he shows and demonstrates what that looks like. He does that by saying, hey, greater love hath no man than what? That he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus set the bar. Jesus not only loved in words, but he gave his life to demonstrate that who was, when, when Jesus died for us, were we in the right? Were we the enemies? Were we the wrong? Jesus died regardless of where we were. No matter how much of a mess we were, no matter how much of an enemy I was to God, no matter how much I said I want no part of it, he died anyway. He decided that this is the one I want to love and I'm going to take it and I'm going to put my life on the line. I'm going to pay the price. That love is, true love, is sacrificial. It, real love has nothing to do with just emotions. It has to do with sacrifice. Sacrifice that says, I'm not looking for anything in return. The love that I can give to someone who loves me back, that's simple. I can love, as we're talking, interacting, Bree, if you're kind to me, I can be kind to you. That's not a big deal. Even the enemies of, the, of God could do that. Even a non-Christian non can love back. But when you are my enemy, <laughs> 
Well, when you put your fist up. But when you're someone I don't like or agree with, or you're someone who is, in my mind, not walking a healthy world, can I love? And should I? And what level? What do I do? Well, when Jesus died for us, we did it without deserving it. He gave the greatest demonstration of what it means to sacrifice. Where we go wrong with the sacrifice, and that's where I want to focus the time. Where we go wrong with the sacrifice is we think that we deny who we are in the name of loving. Jesus never denied his identity. Jesus never sacrificed who he was as an individual. His values, what he cared about, what he came to earth on, he never sacrificed that for the sake of love. He always kept himself intact. Sacrificial love has to do with dying to your flesh. Sacrificing my unwillingness to love, my stubbornness, my pride, my bitterness, my uncomfortableness. It means it's sacrificing my flesh. It's sacrificing the side of me that wants nothing to do with following God. It wants to be comfortable, wants to live its own way. But it doesn't require me to give up my identity, what I value, who I am, what I care about, what matters to me, what drives my life, what is my vision, what is my passion. When a woman in a relationship is being beaten by her husband, is she supposed to just become a doormat? Or does she have a life? And does she have a dream? And should she stay in that? We don't know that for sure. Maybe she should get some help, don't you think? Maybe she should be able to stand who she is. In relationship, when a man loses who he is for the sake of pleasing his wife, he's no longer pleasing her. He's no longer loving her. He's actually giving up his real self. He loses who he is. That's not love. That's called codependency. Learning how to give from your real self. What does it mean to live your true identity and be in relationship and still sacrifice? Wow, that sounds like it's a contradiction. How do I sacrifice but still stay true to who I am? What's not healthy, which I was taught all my life growing up in church, is we use the word joy as an acronym. So, but it was Jesus, others, and then yourself. And that was in the name of ministry. That you serve others before you take care of yourself. And that if you're taking care of yourself, you're selfish. That you're being self-centered. That a Christian throws away the self and lavishly pours into people's lives, even though they're not getting anything. And reality is that is dysfunctional, as dysfunctional, as dysfunctional as it can be. How many of you want to get in your car and drive to Anchorage on an empty tank? How far is that going to get you? Why is it that we would want to minister out of an empty tank? We think that ministry can be about giving, can be a loving, can be something we can do outside of what's going on interior here. That's something that I do. Ministry is not what you do on the outside. <laughs> ministry comes from what's inside. And if our tank is empty and we're giving from an empty place, we are giving with a hook. What do I mean by that? I mean I'm giving with something I'm wanting in return. And it goes contrary to what scripture teaches. Sacrificial love asks nothing in return. It gives no matter what you're doing. What gets us in trouble, this is how addictions actually get set. Is we think we just give and we give and we give. 
out of our own self when we are not taken in. And when we're not taken in and we're giving from ourselves, we've depleted ourselves. And where do we go? We go to addictions. We go to substances. We go to things that fill that tank. Because the number one thing that drives addiction is loneliness, is emptiness. And what happens is we put others before ourselves. And we put others before our family. That is not biblical. You're never to sacrifice your family. You're never to sacrifice your identity for the sake of loving others. It's always based upon being able to take in what is God given us, filling our tank and giving out of an overflow. What I'm getting in comes out. Let me come back to this in a second. When I'm in pain, and I'm hurting, and I love someone in spite of that pain and hurt, and I'm doing nothing to address the pain and hurt, then I'm loving with this idea in mind that somehow in loving them, God's going to heal me as I'm loving them. No, he's not. He's going to work in your own journey first. You get first what you give. It's a, it's a really important principle because what we need to learn out of Matthew 10, 8, he's saying, hey, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. Freely, what? You have received, what? Freely you give. You don't give what you don't have. Ministry comes out of overflow. Ministry comes out of what is going on in here. That what you take in is what comes out. You can't give what you don't have. Yet in ministry, we think that because we know all the right words, we've got the scriptures memorized, we know when to raise our hands during, during worship, and we look really good, uh, so we look like we got it all together, and we, everything looks good on the outside. But truthfully, on the inside... I'm hurting. I'm in pain. My marriage ain't doing so well. I'm struggling with an addiction. I'm struggling with anger. I'm not in a good place. And yet I'm standing out saying, let me minister to you? Where does ministry need to happen? Ministry needs to happen to me first. And out of that comes the overflow. Out of that comes healing. Out of, of that comes wholeness. I'm going to get into that more in a moment. So when I'm in a plane... I've, I've done a million and a half miles on Delta. So I've heard this a million times over. Is the flight attendant gets up and she talks about when the cabin pressure drops, the masks drop, and she's, they say, put the mask on the kid next to you. No. Put the mask on yourself first. Why? Because you can't help someone else if you're not helping yourself first. So Galatians 5, there's tons of other scriptures, says that I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. That being so full of what God intended for your life, there's such a flow of God in you. And what that means is there's, there's healing, there's restoration, there's forgiveness, there's reconciliation, there's ownership and responsibility for taking care of my stuff. There is so much happening inside of me. Why would I ever think about going back when I've got something so good? Why would I settle for a hot dog when I can have lobster and steak? Now some of you say, I love hot dogs. Okay. <laughs> okay. But the idea is that you want to know that what you're taking in is coming into your life. And it's, as you take it in, the quality of that work, now what? It, you can't keep it. It starts to flow into those around you. Love is about overflow. Hear that. Love is about overflow. It's not only about commitment. It's about overflow. Overflow and giving what you have. What have you received? Where has God healed you? Where have you seen forgiveness happen? What has happened in your marriage, in your relationship? Has there been healing there? Whatever level you're in in your marriage or in your life, you can share that. Why? 
Because that's where God's giving you the grace and mercy and love. That's where you can give. You can give it there. You don't have to have it all together. You can give what you've been given. And you can do it well. Why? You've been there. I ain't going to somebody that's going to take me across the Sahara Desert that's never been there. <laughs> that dude can know the book. That dude can tell me every little spot on the book. But he ain't been there. I ain't going in the desert with him. <laughs> There's no one better in helping in ministry is those who have been there. Who have been in those dark places. Have faced those hard places. Have received forgiveness. Have brought healing in their own lives. Have brought healing to their own marriage. And have brought healing in their relationship with their family. They have been there. They've broken the addictions. They have learned what it means to break the bondages. They have been there. It isn't some kind of cute prayer that I give somebody on the outside when I've never walked that journey. That is not going to heal someone. What's going to heal somebody is you giving what you have received to that person who's now walking the journey. So love comes as an overflow. What have you received? What do you have? Nothing more frustrating than to have somebody come up, you know, um, and seeing a, you know, a woman who lost her babies through a miscarriage. And a woman come up to her and say, you know, I wonder if there's any sin in your life. Because we've prayed for you. And the baby still got lost. I'm just wondering, you know, we've done all the right things and you still lost the baby. There must be sin in your life. Now, you know what? A woman who has lost a child, you know she would never in a million years say those words. Why? She's been there. So many times in the name of ministry, we speak to things we have no idea what we're saying. We don't have any clue other than we read it in the Word, so let me just give you the answers without any experience. So that's so important for us to realize that out of the overflow, out of what's happening inside of me is where ministry comes. So filling our tank first, giving from not an empty place, but a, but a place of fullness. You've, many of you have heard me say this over and over again and showed this example, but I'm only going to focus on this for a second. But when that authentic self, that real person, that who you are on the inside when no one else is looking, not the person who comes here all dressed up, but the person behind closed doors that has fear, that has struggles, that makes mistakes, that fails at something, that doesn't always feel confident about their life, that wondering whether they're going to get their next meal or whether their marriage is going to work or not. There is a lot of fear, a lot of struggles behind closed doors that we never speak out in front. So we have these walls that protect us. We keep people out. And what is that like? That's lonely. That's lonely. Matthew 23, 25 and 27. This scripture is not meant to bring shame. It's meant to make us take a real look at where we are. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. First of all, understand, the scribes and the Pharisees wore these robes. They were gorgeous. They were amazingly dressed. And with that, they had ribbons and ropes and all kinds of sashes and stuff. And everything they wore on the outside said how much money they gave, how, much, how long they pray how long they've been devoted to God. Everything on the outside was speaking to their commitment. But God's saying to them, what are you? For you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but on the inside you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first of all, clean up the inside of the cup and dish so that the outside may become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you like the whitewashed tombs. Whoa, you are like the whitewashed tombs. What does that mean? On the outside, everything is beautiful. But on the inside, I'm dying. 
and no one knows. Do you know one of the greatest challenges that non-Christians have with Christians? Is, is that we are really good at showing a face that everything is good. My life looks perfect on the outside. But the truth is, when they get closer, they find out that it's not so true. They see us as hypocrites. Because we're not living what we're talking. You know, there's this, there's this way, there's these different types of markets. And one market in the, in the, in the uh, back in the Middle, West, Middle East, the one market is where this tapestry is all folded up nice and neat and pretty. And on the outside, what you see is this perfect tapestry, just gorgeous. But you have to buy as, you, as is. So I buy the tapestry thinking I've got this amazing tapestry. Then I go home and I open it up. And when I open it up, I see there's flaws. Now, what do you think I'm feeling? Cheated? Betrayed? Deceived? So what is it like when we have this package that Christianity is so beautiful and wonderful and sweet and amazing and God just is so wonderful and he just delivers you and I come down to the altar and everything is all sweet and I never have another problem and, you know, let me help you and that's a bunch of bull. And when they get closer to our life and they start unfolding me, they start getting closer, they see there's flaws. They see there are weaknesses because there's not one person in this room without them. You don't get to escape the fact that we all have sin in our world. You all, we all have struggles. The thing is, is integrity. We lack integrity. Why is that? Because integrity is what's on the inside is on the outside. What you see here is the same inside. That there is not a difference. That that doesn't mean that my inside is perfect. It doesn't mean that I'm put together. It doesn't mean I have it all so that nobody, no more work. I've got it all to sweep by and by. You can just look at my life. No. The reality is I have stuff. But just be real about it. Say what it is. Because there is this other part of the market that takes the tapestry and it hangs it up as it is and you get to see everything there and I get to see the flaws and I get to see the beauty I choose whether I buy that or not but when I buy it I'm buying knowing what I'm buying my faith my relationship the way I love needs to be authentic it needs to be real it needs to show and demonstrate there is a God who loves you yes but you are a real person with real struggles and you are not doing so well in some areas. <coughs> like today, this weekend, <clears throat> I've been gone a lot. I'm telling my wife I'm going to Sadatna for the weekend. Yeah, she just loved that. We're having a bump. More than a bump. And I wish it was all sweet and nice. But I know she's committed, and I am too. We'll get through this. We'll work this. We'll figure this out. But I'm not going to hide that. I'm not going to pretend that everything is sweet now that I've come to Jesus or I've done some kind of deliverance prayer. I have work to do. And it's just as messy as those who don't, or haven't done any work at all. There are places in my life that still needs God's mercy, grace, healing, restoration. You're no different than any sinner that sits out there. The only difference is God is in your life. So integrity is issue. Say what is true. If you're struggling, if you're having a hard time, find those in your life that you can have integrity with. That what's going on on the inside is shared out on the outside. No pretending. No secrets. No hiding. No being deceptive. Give what real Christianity looks like. I know I'm getting a little hard. Hold on, hang on. I'll try to let up a little bit. It's not meant to shame us. It's not meant to hurt us. It's meant to say, look, there's not one thing that has happened in your life that is unredeemable. 
There's not one thing you've made, not one mistake, not one thing that's happened to you, not one struggle that you're in right now. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus for 35, 40, 50 years. I don't care. You still have struggles. And to be able to say, I am still in the journey, and to let that be seen gives everyone around you hope. It hurts us when we're, hurts the people around us when we're given a false sense of what it means to walk with God. And here's the deal. That as I do the inner work, and there's no such thing as being in this walk without doing your inner work or you're just playing games. That as I do the inner work, as I let God heal, as I let God work on my fears and let God face, help me face my addictions or my struggles or my fantasy world or the things that I'm doing that I know that are hurting others. If I allow God to do that as I am healing, as God's pouring into me, at no moment am I disqualified for giving out because what comes in me is to, meant to be given out. So there's no such thing as needing a degree or needing some kind of education or needing some kind of years of, of before you can ever give and are you qualified. You're qualified because you're allowing God to work in you and that work in you now qualifies you to give what you have. There's me at six. My greatest peace is not that I was trying to be rebellious or to lie or to be deceptive. Do you know why that I kept the lack of integrity in my life? Because at six, when I was sexually abused by an older boy, or oh, excuse me, by an older woman, the shame and the pain and the guilt and the feeling dirty, and the feeling unloved, and broken, and damaged. I hated that little boy. My body responded to that touch, and yet at the same time, it was repulsed by it. But because my body responded, and because I'd never said anything to anyone, and that abuse happened over and over and over, I had so much self-contempt for this little boy that I can't stand what he looks like. How would you even think about loving him? I'm never going to let him out. I'm never going to let him be seen. And that part of me, what's part of that? Isn't that a part of my heart? Isn't it a part of my life? And as long as I'm holding that back, that is unredeemed. What do I need? What I needed was for someone to step up and to embrace me and say, Gene, that's not your fault. You didn't do that. You are not for fault at this. It's not your shame. This, and step up and hug and embrace and cry and be there for me and fight for me. Get that person who did that and make sure they, they have consequences. But the fact is, is that none of that happened because I didn't say a word. I stuffed it all inside. So I'm carrying... Hear this, self-contempt. Self-contempt that says, I can't share that with anyone. Because if I do, it will discredit the gospel. It will discredit my witness. It will discredit my ability to have impact on those I'm helping. And so I misrepresent Christianity. And I misrepresent my heart because of fear. Not because I'm trying to be rebellious. I'm going to show a clip from Antoine Fisher. And uh, will you turn the lights, please? And this is where Antoine Fisher was, as a little boy, sexually and physically abused. He was abandoned. He was hurt big time by words and by beating. And here as an adult, he's tried to fix it, tried to face it. And as he's done the inner work, he's coming back around to this now as he's sharing. So you'll get a chance to hear what he has to say. You okay? Thanks. Okay. Just never had a real Thanksgiving at the taste before. <laughs> you didn't have a real one over here either, I guess. Uh, uh, you have a real nice family. Thank you. Got this for you for having me over today. What kind of gift for me? Is it money? 
It's a poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see it without my glasses. Why don't you read it for me? No, I'd rather you read it. Please. Who will cry for the little boy? Lost and all alone. Who will cry for the little boy? Abandoned without his own. Who will cry for the little boy? He cried himself to sleep. Who will cry for the little boy? Who will never have for keeps. Who will cry for the little boy? Who walked the burning sand? Who will cry for the little boy? The boy inside the man. Who will cry for the little boy? Who knew well hurt and pain? Who will cry for the little boy? Who died and died again? Who will cry for the little boy? A good boy he tried to be. Who will cry for the little boy? Who cries inside of me? Who will cry for the little boy, Antoine? I will. I always do. So in my struggle of letting someone see that little boy, it was hard. But it was only when I stepped out into the open and actually let someone embrace. Do you know that in all the years of my work in life, in ministry, in church, in pastoring, a young lady, probably in her 30s, literally wept crocodile tears and asked if she could give me a hug. That's the last thing I would have ever expected. That's the last thing I would have ever expected anyone to do to that little boy. To actually embrace the boy. To actually love the boy. To actually see that he's innocent. That he actually had no shame. That's not his shame to be. It does not belong to him. The guilt of that belongs to the offender. And to be able to embrace that little boy and to see him as lovable. Man, for the first time in my life, I was able to look at that picture at six years old and say, I love him. Forgiving myself is the absolute essential piece to allowing myself to heal. Because if I don't forgive him and he stays in there, then I, everything I do is out of self-contempt. Everything I do, I'm right now, I'm trying to lose weight. And the years pass when I look in the mirror, all I see is this fat guy, unhealthy, how dare you, step it up, get with it, I hate how you look, get back to where you need to be. Or I can say, man, Gene, you know, you want to live life better. You want to be there for your grandchildren. You want to be there for your wife. You want to be there in a healthy way long term. Take care of yourself, Gene. Come on, you can do this. Can you hear the difference in language? Can you see how I'm seeing myself? Anything in the name of recovery done with self-contempt is self-sabotaging. It won't last. It's only when I make movement to heal and receive healing here, forgiveness and acceptance and love, that I can begin to make movement and change by embracing myself, by allowing God to embrace me, and allowing you to embrace me. Now, all those who hide those little boys and little girls, I know how to get to that, and I know how to embrace that. I know what that needs. And it doesn't need condemnation. It doesn't need more shame. It needs mercy and grace and love and tears and hugs. If a five-year-old boy walked in this room right now and he said to me, standing here, I was sexually abused, I wouldn't say, oh, you dirty little boy. My response to him would be to embrace him to hug him, to hear his story, to find out what happened, and to do everything in my power to make sure he's okay. That's what I would do. But why can't I give myself that same grace? Why is it that I could give that to others, but I can't give that to myself? That's self-contempt. 
Why is it that I can love others, but I can't apply the same principles to my own self? Why is it that I give myself sacrificially to others, but I won't give myself sacrificially to myself to take to fill my tank, to take care of myself, to fight for that? Because I don't see myself as valuable. I see myself as dirty, broken, soiled, unlovable, not worth anything. And when I begin to get my worth based on my serving, I am headed for a destructive path. I don't get value in my serving. My serving comes out of my value. It comes from an overflow of who I am. I don't get my identity by what I do. I get it for who I am. I'm a son. And I'm beloved. And he cares deeply for me. And it's when I embrace that that I can actually start looking at some of the more difficult things. So I have up here, I had a dream one night, and it came after a really bad, bad fall. I'd spent years of my life in recovery, recovering from sex and porn addiction. And one night, I slipped up and I went back to a club. I had a year or so of sobriety under my belt, and I went back into the club, and I, I was so mad at myself. I hated myself. I couldn't believe that I had done that. How dare that I could just break my promise break my sobriety. I was just really angry with myself. And uh, <clears throat> so in the middle of the night, I woke up from a really strong dream. Here's the dream. I was in a courtroom and there was a prosecutor and there was a defense attorney and there was a judge sitting right there. I was in the courtroom and I, everything was very, very visual, very real. And the, 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 the prosecutor stands up and he says, Please pull down the screen. He says, what I'm going to show you is Jane's life and how he's a liar, he's a deceiver, he says one thing and he does another, he promised to stop this and he didn't, he did it over here. And he gave instance after instance after instance of my failures, my struggles, my shortcomings, and not one of those were inaccurate. Every one of those were like he was playing my life in front of me. And I had so much shame. It hurt. And he sits down. And the defense attorney stands up and he walks up to, and stands up by me and right in front of me. And he stands beside, actually right beside me. And he stands before the judge and he says, everything that, that the prosecutor has said is true, but it's missing one thing. It's been paid for. He says, I enter into evidence, my hands. They were wounded for his transgressions. He takes his robe off. And he says, by my stripes, he is healed. I suffered for his well-being. Yes, he's guilty, but I paid the price. Wow. To realize... That there is nothing that is not redeemable. Amen. Romans 8, 1, 2. Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When that judge was sitting at the gavel and had his gavel, he hit that table and he says, you're free to go. There is no judgment. There is no condemnation. There is no death. Because of what the price was paid for me. And so the fear that I have about being real. The fear that I have that somehow if I talk about this, this is going to hurt my witness. Or somehow I'm going to lose something. No. Your openness. Your honesty. Your integrity about where you are. And the work that you need to do inside. Only gives you a stronger witness. Only makes you more impactful. Because now there's redemption in your story. Now there is true forgiveness in your story. It isn't coming from something I read. It isn't coming from some sermon I heard. It isn't coming from some worship song. Although those are all powerful, those are just reinforcements of what's happening inside of me. I can come with boldness 
in your presence. And I can say where I've been. And I can say where my struggles are today. Not because I'm some great guy, but because there's redemption. There is grace. There is mercy. There is restoration. There is. And it requires me to put it on the table. It requires me to give my all. That's what he's talking about when it says love God with all. It don't go to God with some. I go to God with all. What is it that you're in, that's struggling, that you're struggling with, that holds you back from really diving into that deeper places? When it hold, what's holding you back from having a bigger impact in your ministry and in your marriage and in your relationship with your kids, relationship on the job? What's holding you back? You can bring that to God. There is redemption for that. There's restoration for that. The enemy is a liar. The enemy knows that if you bring that in the open, he loses a life's work. He loses every hold he's got. He cannot work in the light. That's holding you back. You must take that step forward. Let somebody in. Don't hold back anymore. Because not only will it help you heal, the impact that you're going to have on those who you work with will be significantly better and stronger. Because you've been there, you've done that, you know what it takes. There ain't no easy path in recovery. There ain't no such animal. There ain't no quick fixes. So let's just do this. As we are playing this song, you're used to hearing this song a lot. But I want you to just kind of bring yourself before the Lord. And as we play this song, if there are things in your journey that you know you need to bring, I'm not asking you to come up here and everybody to see what you're bringing. I don't need that. What I want you to do is do personal business. I want you to take this between you and God. And when we're done, you figure out this week who you're going to talk to, who you're going to let in, who you're going to bring to the table with this. You make a decision what you do with it, but now it's just a chance to do that personal business. So if you play a song, please.
pray with you. You would all stand. I want you to just kind of put your hand so it can replace what you see. Place of letting go. Place of being. Whatever that is, that you struggle with. Whatever that is. Even if you don't even know at this moment, maybe you're struggling with it. That's okay. Ask for it. But at this moment, I want you to just kind of release that to the Lord. So I pray. Lord, I pray right now that what's in our hands right now, what we're offering to you, has been redeemed. It is yours. You already knew this from the foundations of the earth. You knew our life from beginning to end, and yet you still chose us. There's not one thing in our world that we're offering that disqualifies us from you loving and forgiving and accepting us. Lord, I ask and I pray for courage to let that go. Courage to take next steps. Courage to, to move towards forgiveness of self and to heal that which has been broken. I ask that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the work. Thank you for the work. And I pray that as we let that go, that we will see the impact on those that we are touched, come in touch with this week and next week, that we'll begin to see the value of letting redemption work in us first. I pray that in your name. Amen. So next week, I'll be continuing this conversation in a different angle. Look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.